Hi everyone, so Bahar and I are going to show you guys how to do the Wittig lab, which is the last lab of the semester. I am first going to start off by taking a 100 milliliter round bottom flask and adding a stir bar. I will now carefully pour in the correct amount of triphenylphosphine that I have measured out onto the scale into my 100 milliliter round bottom flask using a weighing paper to do so. Since I had to weigh out quite a bit of triphenylphosphine, I added in one portion of it the first time, and now I'm adding in the rest of the triphenylphosphine. So this is what my round bottom looks like after I've added in all of my triphenylphosphine. After I've added in my triphenylphosphine, I will now measure out about 20 mils of sodium bicarbonate to add to my reaction. I have now poured some of the sodium bicarbonate solution into this 100 milliliter beaker. I will now proceed to pour about 20 milliliters of the sodium bicarbonate into this 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. Here is the 20 milliliters of sodium bicarbonate that I have measured out. I will now proceed to add it into my round bottom flask. I will now proceed to carefully pour in the 20 milliliters of sodium bicarbonate that I have measured out into my 100 milliliter round bottom flask. I have now measured out the correct amount of p-nitrobenzaldehyde and have put it onto this weighing paper. I will now proceed to carefully pour it into my round bottom flask. I am now proceeding to carefully pour in the amount of p-nitrobenzaldehyde into my round bottom flask. This is what my round bottom flask looks like after I've added in the p-nitrobenzaldehyde into my round bottom flask containing my triphenylphosphine and sodium bicarbonate. I will now proceed to add in my ethyl bromyl acetate into my round bottom flask. This has already been pre-measured out for you, so there's no need to measure it out. Please remember that ethyl bromyl acetate is a toxic lacrimator. This means that it can really make your eyes water and burn. When you are adding this in, please add it in carefully and efficiently. Once you are done adding it in, please cap the vial and put it in your fume hood. So this is what my round bottom looks like after I've added in the ethyl bromo acetate. Once you've added in everything to your round bottom flask, you are now ready to reflux the reaction for one hour. You should already know how to set up a reflux from the Fisher esterification lab. So this is what the reaction should look like when it is refluxing. After you have refluxed the reaction, you can carefully take it off of the reflux condenser Put it on a cork ring and allow it to cool down before working it up. We will be using ethyl acetate to work up this reaction. I will first be measuring about 10 milliliters of ethyl acetate and adding it into my round bottom flask. I am now adding in the 10 milliliters of ethyl acetate into my round bottom flask. You'll probably have to do this several times in order to make sure your product fully dissolves in the ethyl acetate before transferring it to the separatory funnel. As you can see, I am beginning to gently shake the contents of the flask to make sure my product is dissolving in the ethyl acetate. I will now begin my workup. I have set up my separatory funnel on a ring stand and my fume hood and have a glass funnel as well. I will now begin to pour the contents of my round bottom flask into my separatory funnel. As you can see, I am now starting to pour the dissolved parts of my product into the separatory funnel. I have now measured out about 10 more milliliters of ethyl acetate. I will now pour this into my round bottom flask to try and dissolve more of my product before transferring it to the separatory funnel. I will now proceed to gently swirl the contents of my flask to try and dissolve more of my product in the ethyl acetate. Again, you might have to do this several times to get all of your product to dissolve. I am now starting to pour more of my dissolved product into the separatory funnel. Again, I still have more solids in my round bottom flask, so I will have to add more ethyl acetate in order to dissolve it. I am now using a spatula to try and break off the clumps of my solid product so it does dissolve better in the ethyl acetate. Again, you might have to do this several times so all of your product can dissolve in the ethyl acetate before transferring it to the separatory funnel because if there are solids in your set funnel, it will be hard to work up the reaction. Once I've dissolved all of my product in ethyl acetate and I've transferred to the separatory funnel, I will now begin to shake and vent the separatory funnel for a total of three times before draining the aqueous layer. 
Once I have shook and vented the set funnel for a total of three times, I will now begin to drain the aqueous layer into a 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. I will now measure out about 20 milliliters of 10% aqueous sodium bisulfite. This will react with any remaining excess aldehyde and transfer it to the aqueous layer so it can be extracted. I will now add the 20 milliliters of aqueous sodium bisulfite that I have measured out into my separatory funnel containing my product. I will then proceed to shake and vent the set funnel for a total of three times before draining my aqueous layer. I will now shake and vent my set funnel for a total of three times before I begin to drain my aqueous layer. I will now begin to drain my aqueous layer into the same 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask that I previously used to drain my aqueous layer. I will now measure out about 20 milliliters of saturated sodium chloride solution or brine, which will remove any excess water left in my reaction. I will now proceed to add the 20 milliliters of saturated sodium chloride solution that I have measured out into my separatory funnel containing my product. I will now begin to shake and vent my set funnel for a total of three times before draining my aqueous layer. This is the last step of my workup. I will now begin to drain my aqueous layer in the same 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask that I have drained my previous aqueous layers in. I will now proceed to drain my organic layer into a separate 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. I will now add some sodium sulfate to my Erlenmeyer flask containing my product to remove any water that might still be trapped in the organic layer. I am now proceeding to add some sodium sulfate to my organic layer containing my product. Again, you do not need a lot of sodium sulfate. When you see the sodium sulfate is no longer clumping together and is mainly in free floating particles, then that means you have added enough sodium sulfate to your organic layer. I will now proceed to set up a gravity filter with a shark skin filter paper to filter off my sodium sulfate and isolate my organic layer. I will now add some methyl acetate to my shark skin filter paper in order to make it stick well onto the glass filter funnel. This will make it easier to pour my product through the glass funnel and into the round bottom flask. I will now proceed to filter off my product from the sodium sulfate by pouring it through the filter funnel into the round bottom flask. I will then rotavap off my ethyl acetate in the next step. Before I rotavap off my ethyl acetate, I will now wash my sodium sulfate with some of the ethyl acetate in order to ensure I have transferred the maximal amount of product from the Erlenmeyer flask into my round bottom flask. I will now proceed to put my round bottom flask containing my product onto the rotavap. Again, you should know how to use the rotavap because we did use it for the caffeine chlorination lab. As you can see, the ethyl acetate is beginning to get rotavapped off as it is boiling and it will condense back down into a liquid and be collected in the solvent trap. So your brown bottom flask should look like this once most of the ethyl acetate has been rotavapped off. Your product should look like a yellowish solid. So once you are done rotavapping off your solvent and you have your crude product in your round bottom flask, you will now transfer your product from the round bottom flask into 125 milliliter or Lemaire flask to start the recrystallization process. As you can see, I still have some more product left in my round bottom flask, so I'm using a spatula to try and scrape out more of the product and transfer it into my 125 milliliter or Lemaire flask where the majority of my crude product is. To get more of my product out of my round bottom flask and into my Erlenmeyer flask, I will be measuring out some ethanol and just washing my round bottom flask with the ethanol to try and get more crude product into my Erlenmeyer flask so I can recrystallize it. I will now be taking a pasture pipette and getting some of that ethanol that I previously measured out and adding it into my round bottom flask containing my crude product. I will do this until I have transferred most of my crude product into the Erlenmeyer flask. As you can see, I have transferred most of the crude product into my Erlenmeyer flask, and I am now ready to start my hot recrystallization in ethanol. This is to get rid of any triphenyl phosphine oxide 
that could be present in our reaction. I will now add some boiling chips to 125 milliliter Erla Mare flask before I pour in my ethanol so I can start my hot recrystallization. As you can see, I have now put my Erla Mare flask containing my ethanol on the hot plate and it is now boiling. I will now transfer my crude product in the Erla Mare flask to the hot plate as well. I will now start to add some of my boiling hot ethanol solvent with the pasture pipette to my Erla Mare flask containing my crude product. Once I have added in this ethanol, I will let the Erla Mare flask sit on the hot plate and then I will gently pick it up and swirl the contents of the flask to try to dissolve my product in the ethanol. As you can see, my product is not fully dissolved in the ethanol, so I will add more of the boiling hot ethanol solvent to my Erla Mayer flask. Once I've added in the solvent, I will let the Erla Mayer flask sit on the hot plate for a bit and I will gently swirl the contents of the flask. As you can see, my product is not fully dissolved in the ethanol, so I will not be adding any more. Now that my product is fully dissolved in the ethanol, I will take my Erla Mayer flask and place it into a beaker containing ice. This will allow the product to crash out and the triphenylphosphine oxide will stay dissolved in the ethanol. As you can see, there is now solid starting to form in the Erla Mayer flask. This indicates that my product is now crystallizing out of the solution. I have now set up a vacuum filter to filter off the ethanol from my product. You guys should know how to set one up from the Grignier lab. I have now put some ethanol into this beaker and I have placed the beaker into the ice bath to allow the solvent to cool down before I rinse my product with it. Now that a good amount of my product has formed, I will use the spatula to scrape the product off the sides of the Erla Mayer flask. After I have done this, I will now carefully pour my product from my Erla Mayer flask onto the filter paper. I will do this until I have transferred most of my product onto the vacuum system. With the pasture pipette, I will start to take some of my ice cold ethanol solvent and add it to my purified product on the filter paper. I will do this a couple of times to further purify my product. After I've added the ice cold ethanol and allowed the product to dry on the vacuum, I will now carefully transfer my purified product with the spatula into a pre-weighed scintillation vial. After you have done this, please weigh your scintillation vial again in order to get the percent yield and also take an item of your product. Thank you guys for watching. I will see you on Wednesday to start the Wittig Lab.